Listen, uh, we've just been away in Canada for uh, two weeks on account of my father passing away. And I uh, just really wanted to thank everybody who supported us in prayer and expressed their condolences to us. Uh, we really felt the support of your prayers. Uh, because even though losing a, a parent is a difficult time, we just felt like we were just being lifted along gracefully through the whole experience. And so thank God we got to go there and do that. Um, even though uh, Qantas is not such a fantastic airline, maybe just put that on the advertising bill. Uh, it, uh, it took us like 45 hours to get there and 36 hours to get back. It was, like, it was so long. Um, but I got to do my dad's funeral. I got to lead it. Now, probably that's not what everyone gets to do because you're not all pastors, but um, it was a real honor to do my dad's funeral. It's, um, it's good to, you know, to, I just didn't want a stranger doing it, and I wanted to be personal and express my gratitude for what a great dad he was. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and hello to mom, too. Mom said that she'd be watching today. So, um, just really nice. So they, and, and also it was like, you know, some things just become more memorable because of how hard they are. The uh, graveside portion, we did it in minus 40. <laughs> so cold snap came through, set a record, and uh, so we got to uh, freeze our faces off and our hands off, and it was so cold. And I thought, that's just my dad. <laughs> he would have loved that. <laughs> that's for taking so long, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so, but grateful, grateful for the team that we have here and for the great churches, and we're just really, really thankful. I'm going to talk to this point today, good for something. Um, you know, we're, we're, all this year we're going to be focusing on how we, a healthy church is one has a passion for Jesus, a passion for fruitfulness, and a compassion for others. And, that we, and we kind of think that if we did those things, that this would be the most amazing church, or any, any church would be amazing. Wouldn't you wouldn't be part of a community that its number one passion was Jesus Christ? Doesn't that solve so many problems? And, and then what if everybody was just so excited to get up every day and, and be the thing that God made them to be? Wouldn't that be a delightful life? And then wouldn't it be wonderful if we we're part of a community where everybody just cared? Like there was no one, uh, that's somebody else's problem, but everybody's problems became our problems, you know? Like we just got involved. And so we're talking about all these things this year, relying on God's spirit to both reveal and to change us so that we can live out that, that vision. And today we're going to be talking about the idea of being fruitful or the idea that we're made to create. I want to talk today about the creative force because we were, we were made for fruitfulness. We, we were made to make a difference. Now, there's no person here that was made that, that was just kind of like, ah, an additional sort of afterthought. Yeah, they'll do, and they'll just, they'll just fill a gap in the world's population until they die. Every single person was made for a reason. And every single person is capable of enormous amount of fruitfulness. I don't know if you remember, uh, if, you, if you had these. Did you ever have dandelions? Do you ever have dandelions? We used to have seems like always have dandelions in our front lawn. And it would drive my dad nuts when we would go out there, pluck them, and <laughs> blow the dandelion seeds at each other. Because for us, that's all poetic and fun. For dad, that's more dandelions. Yeah. Right? And my dad was one of those precision <coughs> weeders. He actually had some chemical he brought home from the mine that he worked at put it in a syringe, and would inject it into every dandelion. No more fruitfulness. But you see, that idea of seeds and fruitfulness, it only takes one tree to produce multiple fruit. And that's what each of us are made like. You're one life, but your one life can mean a multitude of differences. Not just one of you, but many of you over and over. You see, we are a reflection of this in Genesis chapter 1. This is... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Then the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. 
You see, at the beginning, there, there was nothing. God made everything. That's the essential idea of him being the creator is because from his being comes everything else. He exists, so other things come into existence. And by his desire and by his will and by his word, things are spoken into being. Because he existed, you exist. But it's all cast in this drama. You notice how in that drama, there's forces that seem to be against what God is trying to do. There's chaos, there's turmoil, there's trouble. And there's God making a difference against those things that are trying to hold him back. See, God brings things into being by the force of his own will. I don't know if you know much about science, but you're going to get a little science lesson today. Here is a picture of what we call an atom. Atoms were named atom because of their, that means cannot be cut. But of course, then we split the atom. So <laughs> these are one of the most poorly named things in the universe. But the atom is meant to be the essential building block of all things. Like if you don't have atoms, you don't have anything else. They are organized systems. And in every atom, you can see there's these electrons that are spinning around, around and around, a, 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 the nucleus, which is made up of neutrons and protons. And when God brought things into being, this is essentially what he did. He brought things into motion. You see, the electrons move. Do you know when electrons will stop moving? Never. Electrons have no power, like they have a negative electricity force, and they just move and move and move and move in orbit around that nucleus, and they will never, ever stop. And you don't need to charge them up. You don't need to plug them in. They just move. Because why? Because God made them to move. And if, if we were to do this to scale, and we said, let's make that nucleus that big, do you know how far away those electrons would be moving? They would be over in the Elizabeth Shopping Center. Because the atom, in a sense, compared to the size of its parts, is enormous. And as those parts and pieces came into being and came into motion, God caused those things to have meaning. And he made atoms different. So we have the hydrogen atom, which doesn't have a neutron because it doesn't need one to balance the electric force in it, in case you're wondering. It's a very simple thing. Whoops, sorry. Here I am giving you away. It's got this little thing, electrons zipping around. And that's all it takes to make a gas that one day is probably going to power your car. It's hydrogen. But then you take something else complicated that God made. He made oxygen. That has eight electrons, eight protons, eight neutrons. And those eight electrons move around in different valences, which means levels on the outside of the atom. They have different orbits. And those two things, on their own, are fantastic. You can drive a car, but also oxygen is really important. You're breathing it now. Isn't it amazing? But with just hydrogen and with just oxygen, it wasn't enough. So God created water by combining those two things. You know, one of the most amazing things about water is that there is no scientific knowledge that exists that could have predicted that water would be the outcome of hydrogen and oxygen. Nobody would have known. In fact, we have to do it all theoretically. We just make stuff up. We just go, well, what if? Put it together, see what happens. But hydrogen and oxygen exist, and because they combine, they create the possibility for all kinds of life all plant life, all human life. Everything that exists on this planet relies on water to exist because God made it. Now, these beautiful and wonderful things then should just kind of be on their own and just be great. Let's just all enjoy them. But that's not what that scripture says. It's not as simple as just create. There's this, there's this thing. It's, a, not a, it's not even a theory. It's a scientific fact. It's called entropy. Entropy is a lack of order or predictability, a gradual decline into disorder. In the Bible, we would call that chaos, complete disorder or confusion. Because like in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. 
There is this uncreatedness that is always at work to try to stop creation from being. And it is always negative. Do you know what scientists think? Scientists think that all of these things, all the, you know, your body's made up of cells, and those cells are made up of atoms, and all those atoms are fantastic. Do you know what most of the, science, the scientific community think? Eventually, all those cells are going to go and do their own thing. They're just going to, you're, one day you'll die, and your cells will go see you, and they'll go off and do something else. Be a plant, be a tree, be a fox. Who knows? But then even those cells will break down. And they think that ultimately the end of the universe is just hydrogen. Just useless vapor. Because entropy says everything complicated eventually breaks down. Everything that is organized becomes disorganized. It says, uh, some of the texts I was reading about says, all things tend towards disorder. More specifically, the second law of thermodynamics states that as one goes forward in time, the net entropy, the degree of disorder, of any isolated or closed system will always increase. That is, as you go forward in time, everything breaks down into much more simple things. Entropy simply is a measure of disorder and affects all aspects of our daily life. Left unchecked, disorder increases over time. Do you think if we left that house as it was, it would eventually go back to the very perfect and functional state that it was when it was made? You see, human beings had to take simple elements and make them complicated and perfect them. Ooh, how's that? Perfect them so that they became useful. And then entropy works against that, constantly pulling it down. There's creation, and then there is anti-creation. So what can be done? Well, I want to tell you today that you are that creative force in God. You're it. You you are the created being with consciousness who can organize the disorganized. You can take the broken and make it well. You can make the useless and make it useful. You can make, take the ugly and make it beautiful because you are the creative force. When God made you, he breathed his life into you. That's why human beings are so different than everyone else. You know, this science guy I was reading, he says, organisms organize. We sort the mail, we build sandcastles, we solve jigsaw puzzles. We separate wheat from chaff, we rearrange chess pieces, we collect stamps, we alphabetize books, we create symmetry, we compose sonnets and sonatas, we put our rooms in order, some of us do. <laughs> we propagate structure. And not just we humans, but all things that are alive. Not only do living things lessen the disorder in their environments, they are in themselves, like their skeletons and their flesh, vestigules and membranes, shells and carapaces, leaves and blossoms, circulatory systems and metallic path, metabolic pathways, miracles of pattern and structure. All things that God made have order. But there are two forces. I want to bring this message today, and forgive me if it's not very well organized, because I was putting it together on the journey from Los Angeles to Sydney in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep and felt inspired, so I took a pile of notes and wrote down a bunch of things. And if they come out in any kind of order, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but it's something I've been thinking about for several years, that there is a creative force, but there is also a power that resists it. Even in the beginning of creation, God was making something beautiful and wonderful, and there was, a, there was a power to disorganize it, to uncreate it, that God had to overcome in order to make something good. And I want you to know this. Are you looking at me? Just briefly. <laughs> this force is at work in your life to stop you from being created, creative, to stop you from doing the good that you were made to, make, to do. So when, 
Jesus was preaching to humanity in his very first sort of public address in front of thousands of people, thousands of broken people, thousands of what you would call useless people, thousands of people you would look at and go, what? (laughs) This is what Jesus said about us. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, well, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light in all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. At that time, Jesus was preaching to a dark world. But he knew that with his help and life, he could take people who were dark and make them light. Because he knows what you are. You're a light without power. You're a light that just doesn't have the power of God. But with the power of God, you light the world. Who can take, if you ask any scientist about, how do you take salt that's lost its saltiness and make it salty again? Do you even know what that means? It's atomic breakdown. If it's no longer salt, it's not salt. But who can take things and make them what they're not? Well, God can. He can make it so that our chemical flavor actually influences others again. Because only he can lift us out of, so that we can be what we're supposed to be. And you and I, we need to accept the fact that God wants us to make fruit, to make light, to light the house, and to recognize that you are not here for nothing. You were made for good. You are good for something, but there are forces that are at work against us. So why do we fail to create good then? Why why do we start and then stop? Why do we self-sabotage? This this thinking has made me look at some of the biblical leaders that I've, you know, I've read the Bible many times. You probably have heard a lot of the stories I'm about to refer to, but I think about some of these stories in a new light as I see things differently. You know, King David, awesome guy on the battlefield, right? He is your wide receiver. He is your quarterback. He is your full forward. He is your spin bowler. He is the guy on the team that'll win the game for you. You give that guy a sword and a shield or even just a sling, he's going to win the battle. Ba-boom. And the moment the battles stop, And he's sitting in his palace going, hello, what do I need to do with myself now? What happens? Looks over the edge and sees Bathsheba taking a bath, Sheba. (laughs) And ba-boom, he blows his whole life up. Why would you do that? Why would you, after everything, he's finally got a moment where he doesn't need to go to war and he can build a kingdom, build an empire, build a family, take the kingdom of God that he understands and establish it across the earth. He could do that. And what does he do? (laughs) Blows the whole thing up. Is there something on my forehead? (laughs) But maybe you're the same. Maybe at the very moment where you have to do something that you've never done before, the first time you have to create and be uncomfortable. You do something to make it so that you can't. And maybe it's the same thing with Moses. Moses is okay leading a tribe of ex-slaves across a desert, leading with a stick. And God says to him, stick time over, talkie time now. And Moses stutters, and he's uncomfortable leading in a new way, and he's frustrated, and he smacks a rock twice that God said, I'll hit once, and he blows up his chance to lead the people into the thing that he has been telling him is coming. It's like dying the day before your birthday. But why did he do it? It makes me think, maybe Moses was actually blowing up his own life. Uh, Maybe when Noah, having 
pulled this hundred year plan of building an ark and getting all of the livestock and all the animals and everything on board. It's like herding cats. Yeah. And he's, he's pulled them on, but he goes through this time of the flood. And after the flood, what does he do? Gets drunk. Because everything is different. And Noah pre-flood isn't going to be the same leader of Noah post-flood. And Noah doesn't know what to do. And Noah self-sabotages. And then there's Samson, the ultimate self-sabotager. You know the story, enormously strong, given the Spirit of God to conquer the Philistine armies. And what does he do? Chases after women. And, and the woman that he picks, do you all read the story? Have you read the story, Samson and Delilah? Delilah, where do you get your strength from? <laughs> well, and he makes up a bunch of lies. Samson, read the room. Why do you think she's trying to find out? She's not curious. She's not trying to make a diary entry. She's not going to keep it for posterity. She's going to tell. And he's like, well, it's my hair. <laughs> Samson, Samson had everything going for him and he threw it away. Why would people do that? No, listen, why do you do that? And there's Peter. Peter's walked with Jesus. He's walked on water with Jesus. And then the moment a slave girl comes and challenges him about his association with Jesus, he goes, ah, not me, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Runs away. Curses and swears at a young girl, thank you very much, PG. Runs away. Why would you do that? Listen, can, can you just look at me just carefully just now, just for a minute? I just want you to just, I'm going to say something, and then you can judge this and hate me later. You might have things going on deep inside of you that you are constantly writing yourself off for. Not me. Somebody else. I don't know what to do. I'm not good enough. If it, it would be easier, if it was easier, I would... You said, there might be things about you that are forces of uncreation stopping you from being the thing that you were meant to be. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells this parable. He says, it's going to be like a man going on a journey and calls his servants and he trusts us to them, his property. To one, he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. Each according to his ability. Notice that? Each according to his ability. Does the person with the one talent have ability? Yes. And so he's giving an entrustment. One goes away. Who received the five talents? He traded them. He made five more. He also had two talents, made two more. Ba-boom, ba-boom. Then the one. He had to receive the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground here have what's yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I had scattered no seed. You knew ought to have invested my money with the bankers. At my coming, you should have received what was my own with interest. You did nothing. Now, I was read that parable a hundred times through the lens of, you know, what a jerk, what an idiot, what's the matter with him? And now I read it going, I think I put my talents in the ground a lot. And why do I do that? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid. And this fellow, he buried his talent because he's afraid. And he makes up a story about how God just isn't fair. You're just mean. You're just demanding. Nobody was demanded anything. The five and the two guys, they didn't think God demanded anything. They just were glad they could do something. And this guy turns his own weakness into an accusation against God. And he buried his talent. Now, I want to say this. You've got buried talents. You have been given something to make the world more beautiful. And it's underground right now. 
And you need to dig that sucker up and at least get it in the hands of someone who can use it or use it yourself, but don't bury it. Romans chapter 7, verse 21. So I find it a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. You see, the man who had the one talent also had a counselor. There was an evil force that said, bury it, it's safer. Good preaching. Ooh, I'm preaching at you good. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus starts his ministry. He went into Capernaum. Now, Capernaum wasn't the town that he grew up in. It's not his family town. He's from, he's from Nazareth. So Capernaum is like the next door neighbor town. And immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. Then he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. And immediately there was the synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I wish that that spirit could get his voice. He'd hear himself talking. So you're attacking Jesus with the accusation that he's the Holy One of God. Ah, uh, dumb. Look, come on. You're basically saying, I know that you're the greatest superhero in the world. Therefore, I'm going to get you angry. Look, just, just dumb. But notice this. At the very moment when Jesus is using his creative ability, the gifts that God has given him, there is an opposition that arises. And you will see again and again in Jesus' life, he goes and does something new and beautiful. There's an opposition to try to stop him. Every single time he does something new, there is a new opposition to his life. But does he stop? No, he does he bury it and go, oh yeah, I guess you're right. Who do I think I am? Oh, maybe the son of God. No, he just like, he doesn't self-doubt. Yeah. He just goes, ah, oh, yeah, you there talking? Zip it, zippy, you're out of here. Kicks the demon out. Second Timothy, as I come to a close, the Apostle Paul says this. He's talking to young Timothy lad. He's a leader. He's the bishop of Ephesus by this stage, but a person of deep insecurity. Clearly from his, what's been written to him, Timothy self-doubts constantly. So he says, as for you, always be sober-minded. And that doesn't mean not drunk. It means clear thinking. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforward, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do you notice right in the middle there? He says, I had to fight the fight. What is holding you back from the thing you were created to do? What are you going to do about it? And okay, I... Over my ministry life, there's been seasons of change. And so I'm not, I'm, everybody doesn't have to be a preacher or whatever. That, that's just my job. That's what I'm doing. But over my ministry life, I've had challenges that every time I have to step up to a new level, I always feel like I can't. And every time I feel like I'm called to do it, it always feels like a fight. And it never gets easier. There are times, like recently somebody asked, um, how are you, what are you doing to improve your preaching? And I had to scratch my head and I thought, I don't think I'm doing anything anymore because I'm not trying to improve my preaching. I'm trying to get better at coaching other people to preach. But do you know how hard it is to coach other people to preach? You just sit there in the chair the whole time going, eh, don't say that. Not like this, like that. Not that I don't love and respect all of our preachers. And you're doing a great job. It is easier to preach than to become a great coach of preachers, but Jesus called me to coach preachers. To lead and be a pastor with a person who cares for the flock individually, to change and become a leader of leaders, of pastors who care for the flock, was hard, 
constantly facing insecurities. But you know the hardest battle of all for me? It was when Jesus said to me, you need to start writing. I need to start writing. Do you know how hard it is to write? And then, and as soon as you start doing the thing that you're supposed to do, that you've got a gift to do, do you know what happens? The forces of hell are unleashed against you. They all get together and go, we got to stop this thing before it gets beautiful. We got to keep it ugly. We got to break this guy. We got to get him to stop. So you know what happens? Every kind of distraction under the sun is suddenly popping up. Oh, I got to get busy with that. No, oh, this is really important. Those people are whinging about something. I got to fix that. And then there's this money issue. And the water, well, this is, everything's going wrong about it. You just, I just want to say this. When you start to become the person you're gifted to be, there is a fight. And the Apostle Paul says, you got to fight that fight. You don't bury it. You fight it. You show up and you do it. You bit sober-minded thinking, I got to get this done before I'm in the grave. And you got to get to it. Oh boy, I'm getting a bit excited here. There's some of you yeah, that you are called, called to way more than you're currently doing. And you have got a talent and a gift to bring the beauty of God in some way. Who knows what it is? You're the one with the gift. It could be loving people. It could be serving people. It could be musical. It could be artistic. It could be creative. It could be making. It could be helping. It could be engineering. It could be a thousand things. I don't know. God's the creator. Nobody knew that hydrogen and oxygen was going to make water. But God knew that your gift would bring life to somebody. And you burying it is not helping. You got to get that shovel out and you got to start digging. I told my daughters when they were dating, when they thought about dating, some dads carry guns. I don't carry a gun. I carry a shovel. Because with a shovel, you can kill a man and you can bury the evidence. I was a tough talker. I was a really nice guy. But you got to get that shovel out and you got to fight the fight. You got to keep it going. Because I guarantee you, as soon as you start trying, the devil's going to make you busy as, worried as, distracted as. And you are the only one that can make sure you get your gift on the altar. You're the only one. He can't do it for you. You've got to do it. So let's pray that God will give us strength in this fight. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you that not only do you create us and you give us these gifts, but you also provide us with the grace of your Holy Spirit to fight the fight. Lord, because you are the ultimate creator and every gift that you have given us is an expression of your loveliness and your beauty and your goodness. Lord, you want to see those gifts expressed, those lives lived in their beauty, those lights shining. So, Father, we pray through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you help us to fight the fight. And, Lord, where we've given up, where we've given in, where we've fallen for the distractions, where we've given into the temptations, where we've given into fear, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, heal our hearts from their rebellion to the plan that you've given us. Lord, forgive us for becoming weak when we needed to be strong. And Lord, we pray that you would resurrect us up into life again and give us the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can be the people that you have called us to be, Lord. Lord, help us to repent totally of unfruitfulness, Lord, and give us a passion to fight the fight and to be a creative force for good in this world. So, Lord, we pray that you help us now and give your simple loving grace to every one of us to heal us, restore us, but also, Lord, to empower us to be what you've called us to be. We pray for this now in Jesus' name, and we have total faith that you will answer us. Amen.